I was mostly going to talk about uh, investing in the SDGs, climate change, and well-being, as uh, um, it says in the bullet points for the session. But I, I just wanted to pick up on what Lada said. And I, I think what she's done is a perfect example of how the higher level thinking that's needed to um, evolve humanity into a sustainable form. We tend to break society into parts and reductionistically come up with tax and other ideas that sound good but have unintended consequences. So stepping back and using a holistic perspective or a social anthropology perspective, I think is a way to come up with new, more effective ways of, of doing things. Uh, just picking up on the income redistribution, a benefit of a whole system perspective can illuminate a major deception in that area. For example, in the United States, you often hear especially conservative media saying that taxing the wealthy is unfair tax redistribution to low and middle income people. But what's actually happening in the US is we're having a massive redistribution of public wealth from the many to the few. We send at least several trillion dollars per year to the top of society through many forms of corporate welfare. And you can see inequality has been growing in the US for 40 years. We've got the highest inequality in the developed world and nearly the highest uh, in the world. So it's not so much that we need tax redistribution. What we have to do is stop the unfair tax redistribution that's happening right now and then equally and fairly distribute resources uh, throughout society as all sustainable systems do. If we want to survive, we have to have equitable resource distribution. Taxation is a, is a key component of that. Um, in, in terms of the SDGs, uh, we've all, uh, Stefan, Mariana, and others have talked about the excellent work that's already being done to achieve the goals and the, and the things that are being envisioned, like with, with uh, Stefan. And I, I think that type of work is outstanding and should be greatly expanded. I want to suggest another level of work uh, around financing uh, the SDGs. And that, as, I, as I mentioned earlier, if a big picture perspective shows that the environmental, social, and economic problems being addressed by the SDGs have root causes. And the ultimate root causes are reductionistic thinking and the flawed economic and political systems that result from that. These systems force every company to degrade the environment and society. It's the kind of thing in the future that people will look back on, like, why are you doing that? It's crazy, like slavery. So mm -hmm. if we just focus on the problem and not the systems that are creating the problem, we can't get there. So we, we have to somehow find ways to change those systems. A whole system approach shows actions are needed in all areas of society. But one of the most important and least addressed areas is to use investing uh, to drive the uh, to, to drive system change and achieve the SDGs. And in terms of how to do that, we've got a, a well laid out roadmap for it. Um, 15 to 20 years ago, I was the head of research for the largest company in the world, rating corporations on sustainability performance. We rated the world's largest 2,000 companies and sold those ratings to institutional investors who made investment products out of it. And as those investors shifted their investments based on which companies were sustainability leaders, the companies were compelled by their owners to engage in proactive sustainability strategies. We can use the exact same approach to engage the corporate and financial sectors in system change. Right now, they often block change through lobbying and campaign finance by rating companies on system change performance and then developing funds on them, we can use the capital markets to drive companies to engage in system change. Um, I'll talk a little bit more, the details of that more tomorrow, but just to kind of frame out one important part of it. If we go out uh, and talk about specific system flaws, uh, like limited liability and others, the, the mechanisms that force companies to degrade the environment and society and say we're gonna get rid of limited liability, will get very little traction. So in, instead, you wouldn't, I would suggest, talk specifically about which systems to change. Instead, we'd make a strong business case for system change, illustrating how these systems put business in conflict with society and cause growing problems for business and investors. So by changing these systems, companies, and also to illuminate how these systems are gonna change one way or the other, and companies are better off taking a seat at the system change table and, and working to, uh, uh, to voluntarily improve the systems. Okay, so um, one, one other, I, I 
just wanted to address also consciousness and technology briefly. Consciousness, uh, we had a, a bit of a discussion about that yesterday. Does consciousness have to precede action? And in general, yes, all, all action begins in the mind. So elevating consciousness is essential uh, for, you know, as Einstein said, we need higher level thinking. That's a form of higher consciousness, whole system thinking to evolve human society into sustainable form. But we don't, oh, we, we, we don't have a lot of time and maybe we don't have enough time to get everybody to raise their consciousness. So there are exceptions to the idea that we have to raise consciousness before we have major change. One is pain. Pain's the great teacher. When pain's high enough, low consciousness, people will change. Another one is profit. Uh, that's what we did at Innovest, uh, the company I managed. We went to Wall Street and our leading argument was don't do this because it's good for the environment or society. Do it because you'll make more money. Here's why. And then even low consciousness people do it who are only interested in profit. Uh, not that there's anything wrong with profit. I don't mean to insult, insult them by calling them low consciousness. But um, if we make the business case for system change and show companies how to make more money by engaging in system change, and there are lots of reasons why I can talk about that more tomorrow, uh, then even the lower consciousness companies will get involved in it. Um, another, another way to facilitate system change related to consciousness is that higher consciousness doesn't need to be this whole complex thing that involves many years of meditation or something. It can be an intellectual process that simply recognizes our current level of consciousness that creates the problems is separation, the illusion that we're separate from each other in nature, the higher consciousness is the recognition that we're all parts of one interconnected system, even if that's not obvious to our, our five senses. So interconnected thinking would lead to different economic and political systems that would incentivize different corporate behavior, and that's probably the most important action needed to achieve the goals. Um, and then just the, the fourth point is that not, as, as Mariana correctly pointed out, we don't need everyone to raise consciousness. This is a tipping point, maybe as you said, 10% will be enough. And then one final point about um, technology, because uh, we've got digital currencies on our agenda here. Um, well, the, the, a lot of times people talk about fear of uh, automation leading to layoffs. Many studies have shown that 30% uh, or more of the jobs in the US could be lost over the next 20 years due to automation. Um, other problems with cryptocurrency or, or AI, maybe AI would take over or something. The, uh, the key with technology is who controls it. Um, so if, if technology, as it has been in the US for 30 years, is used primarily to maximize the wealth of a small group of people, then it will be used in ways that sometimes harm society. If we use it that way, then yes, we may lay off 30% of our workforce over the next 20 years. But if we had democracy, then we would say instead, let's use technology to serve the people, and then we could use it, for example, to cut the average work week from 40 to 20 hours per week and maybe make it cheaper and easier to meet basic needs so that people could spend more time with their children and, and do what they love. So I don't think we need to be afraid of technology. The key is to have democracy and that we, the people, control everything in society, including technology, and ensure that it's used to maximize our long-term well-being. Thank you.